Welcome to week two of our CO 232 class, which is uh, Linux administration. Today we'll talk about installation and basic usage of Linux. So installation is a wonderful process that allows you to actually build a new operating system. It's like creating the world, the Big Bang. And installation is a very important step because decisions that you make as part of installation often cannot be undone very easily. Okay? So installation should not be something that you just go ahead and, and do. It should be a result of some testing, maybe some practice. So you do a couple of installations initially and then do the final installation. Okay? Um, because certain elements like the amount of partitions or the size of partitions, you may not be able to adjust later on. Now granted, a lot of things can be adjusted. For example, if you choose a uh, few pieces of software to be initially installed, you can add more software later, right? That's no problem. Uh, but as you do that, you may uh, come to some limitations. For example, let's say that you install the initial Linux system and then uh, you immediately upgrade. That means that you cannot uh, use then the local CD-ROM or DVD that you have to add more software because the software that's on the CD-ROM is compatible with the version of Linux that you initially installed. Since you've upgraded already, you now have to use the software that's in the repositories that is matching your operating system. So you can see that uh, sometimes uh, uh, it makes good sense to spend a little bit more time preparing for an installation, testing it, and, and then executing it. So installation should be something that we execute and not just uh, basically fly, uh, fly with. So for a moment, let me talk about a couple of ways that you can use Linux in this class. First of all, you can use our Raider server. So if at home you have uh, the Windows operating system, okay, you may choose to download a program called putty.exe. This program is going to allow you to connect to various um, services. These do not have to be all Unix services. They can be Windows services. But let me show you how this works. I'll go ahead and download one. You do not have to install this program. You just execute it, right? So even here in the classroom where you don't have administrative rights, you can just download it on your desktop and then go ahead and execute it. And this program, being a Windows program, has uh, just a little bit of a GUI, a graphical user interface, and gives you different uh, methods of accessing systems. If you say Telnet, it means you're accessing the Telnet server, and you can have Telnet on Windows if you wanted to. Uh, remote login, SSH is really the most common way of accessing servers today because it is encrypted and it offers extended functionality. It offers uh, SSH, uh, allows you to remotely copy files from your system to the remote system. It allows you to do some identification where you can distribute um, uh, RSA or, or DSA certificates and then log in to those systems without actually retyping your password. So it's really an extended feature, um, a protocol, and, uh, and, and something that's uh, used very often. So it defaults to that. So here in class, you just go ahead and type in uh, our host name. Okay, and if when I press open, it's going to first of all ask me to accept the certificate uh, that identifies Raider. Once I accept it, our communication is going to be uh, encrypted, and uh, go ahead and use your Blackboard username and password to access the system. Okay, so we go ahead and uh, say open. This is going to work uh, from home or here from the classroom. I'll say yes and we go ahead and log in. Okay, so I am now logged in to the system and I can, uh, uh, I can see what's happening on the system. Okay, so today we're talking about installation, we're talking about running Linux. Well, this is about the easiest way to get a hold of a Linux prompt, uh, either to uh, practice uh, our lab, so in addition to lab connection, you want to run a few commands, you can do that from home right away. Okay. Any questions about this uh, method so far? Okay, so make sure that today everything is working for you, uh, th that you can actually do that. 
What other ways have you heard about uh, that you can run Linux at home? What other ways? Virtualization. Virtualization. Okay, great. Virtualization is a very powerful way of running Linux, and, and I uh, let me come back to that in just a minute, and we'll do this today together in the lab. In, in addition to virtualization, what are other ways to run Linux? Please. Okay, great. So you mentioned two. One is just to go ahead and install it. So you take the Windows system that you have at home, uh, maybe one that you share with a family, and uh, you put in this, the DVD that came with a textbook, and you restart the computer, this is going to kick in the installation program uh, for, uh, for Fedora 13. And then you're going to reinstall the entire operating system, which means that uh, you no longer can use the Windows system that was there before. Yes? Excellent, excellent. So, so that's the first one uh, that, that you've mentioned. We reinstall it completely. I do not recommend that method for learning, okay? Once you are comfortable with Linux and you say, okay, this workstation, I inventory the hardware, which means that I know that I will not have conflicts, or at least I know how to deal with the conflicts. Because really, when you go to the store, let's say you go to Best Buy, most of the computers that are sold today are built for Windows, okay? which means that there are drivers for the little devices that are inside of your computer, like the network card, um, your video card. There are drivers available for Windows. Are the drivers available for Linux? Well, we don't know, right? So there are ways for us to inventory uh, the hardware of the computer and then make sure that um, our operating system that we were going to install, Fedora 13, it actually works uh, with uh, the hardware that we have. This is the common mistakes that people make when they install uh, Linux on laptops. Why? Because laptops have some specialized hardware like network, uh, wireless network cards. These are very often not open sourced. Uh, there are wireless uh, companies that basically do not allow, through legal means, they do not allow Linux distributions to include drivers uh, in, um, as, as uh, ker uh, kernel modules on distribution or even through download, right? The other piece of concern are video cards. Um, NVIDIA, ATI uh, also do not allow, at this point, uh, distribution of those drivers, okay? So there are a couple of things to think about before doing the installation because you don't want to be in a situation where you've installed Linux and on most of these systems the command line will work, but then you cannot run your X window server, you cannot see the graphical user interface, or you cannot access the internet, you cannot get to, uh, to uh, the resource that you really need to resolve your other problems. Okay. The other thing you mentioned was dual boot. I also do not recommend dual boot for that simple reason that a lot of things can go wrong with dual boot. To do dual boot well, you have to first resize your permission, uh, permission partition. Most of the time when you pick up computer at Best Buy, you end up with a C drive that takes up the entire disk or close to it. And in order to install another operating system, you have to shrink that C drive to be smaller. There is a program out there called Partition Mar Magic there's open source uh, QParted, uh, which allow you to do that. The problem is, as you're resizing the partition, and for some reason the power goes off, or your computer shuts down, okay, your, your partition is, is, is done for, okay? Your, your Windows partition, basically. So uh, this resizing of partitions can be, can be difficult. The dual booting of computers really is thing of the past, because it doesn't really have a good it doesn't have a good implementation in the business world. It's not like on Monday you're gonna run Windows Server here, and then on Tuesday you're gonna reboot that server and you're gonna run Linux, right? It's not really practical in the business world. So that's how we arrive to virtualization. But you're right, there's another way of doing that. You can pick up a live CD, and most distributions today have that. Uh, Nopix is a very old live uh, CD distribution where all you have is a CD-ROM. You put that CD-ROM in the computer. You start up the machine, 
and you can run Linux right off that CD drive without your hard drive in running. And this type of distribution is used very often for security. So let's say that you got hacked or you have some bad virus. You cannot even boot your system, your Windows system. You take the live CD, you pop in the drive, boot up the system, and you can actually edit the drive or make a copy of it uh, and, and try to uh, rescue it with the live CD. So let's go, go to virtualization, okay? Because virtualization is where I would recommend you, you start. There is a whole set of virtualization platforms. Uh, it, what virtualization are you uh, aware of? Any companies that you know do virtualization? Please. <laughs> Very good. So, VirtualBox from used to be Sun. Okay, uh, VirtualBox, right here. VirtualBox is great. We're not going to use it, okay? <laughs> but it's great because it is an open platform. It's open source, and if you have a Mac, okay, this is really the only uh, cost-free uh, virtualization that you can run. Okay, so open box or uh, open box, virtual box uh, is great. It runs and it's going to let you install uh, Windows, Linux, whatever it is that, that you want to run. Okay, anything else in addition to virtual box? Okay, VMware. VMware is really the leader in uh, in this uh, IT industry in this space. Uh, VMware has many many advanced products for server virtualization. You buy a huge box, maybe it costs $20,000, and you can run hundreds of servers inside of that box. Okay, beautiful technology. And they do have a free product which will run on Windows. It is not free on a Mac, okay, but it is free on Windows, and that is called um, uh, VMware uh, Player. Because it's free, it's hard to find it. Right here. <laughs> okay, VMware Player. You can go ahead and uh, register at VMware.com, and once you have an account, you then can download VM Player for free. Okay. I have a question. When, when a company does that, do they usually have another? <laughs> okay, so uh, VirtualBox and VMware is what we're talking about. I do like VMware because there is an enterprise strength. Uh, server virtualization so your skills that you gain from just running VM player okay where you can manipulate the virtual hardware uh, you, you, you start figuring out what virtualization is all about those skills will apply directly to the enterprise world that's out there it's very strong with virtualization okay okay now you mentioned that uh, your open uh, box didn't install well uh, was it on Windows uh, XP or uh, Vista or Vista okay all right um, and the error messages didn't Windows 764, Windows 764 and, and and the error messages didn't point you in any good direction okay so if if open box open a virtual box doesn't work for you try uh, VMware okay they and they're perfect there you go as long as one of them uh, is working any other virtualization systems that you can think of yes Excellent. So Microsoft uh, is in staying behind the scenes. There's a lot of money in virtualization. So they now have their own virtualization, uh, server virtualization systems. And that's great. You know, um, originally, uh, you could connect to a Windows system remotely, right? But then you would basically blank out the desktop, okay? Then there was a company that got involved with uh, Microsoft and that company, um, uh, it's, uh, it wasn't Cisco. Uh, oh, they create web acceleration systems. Um, accelerator, um, Citrix, there we go. So Citrix got involved with Microsoft and they helped Microsoft build technology that we use today with remote desktop. So you can have multiple clients connect to a Windows server. And they can have, you know, multiple virtual desktops. So in a way, that was sort of the precursor to virtualization, the idea that, hey, you have one server, you can connect multiple uh, remote systems. Uh, but of course, uh, virtualization is more than that because you actually build virtual hardware 
not just virtual desktops. Okay, great. There is also open source Gen, um, and Gen spells uh, uh, Gen. I, I think that's how it goes. There we go. So Gen allows you to also do virtualization. Uh, but strictly uh, open source, right? You run a Red Hat, you run Gen, and then you can run multiple Windows systems, multiple other systems uh, inside of it. So let's take a look at how we will be using uh, virtualization uh, in, in our class. First of all, I, and I should have checked that a little bit earlier, but uh, under C drive, there is an ISO directory, there it is, and you should have uh, a file there. Uh, I have Fedora 14. Okay. This ISO file is basically the same as a DVD drive, the optical disk. All the data from the DVD is basically imaged into a single file called the ISO file. So this is how we will actually build, um, this is the source for building our, our Linux system. Next, if we go to start all programs VMware, I will go ahead and start VMware Player. And it asks me to go ahead and uh, accept, accept the license. Uh, it'll be good if you uh, go with me, uh, go along with me on this demo. So I'll go ahead and power up your computer. Yes? OK. Um, so you might be asked uh, for some uh, follow-up updates. It's asking me right here to update software. Go ahead and say skip this version. Again, we don't have admin rights. Even if the download succeeds, we will not be able to up, upgrade the software. Say it again. You can press X, that's fine. Yeah. So this is basically a blank VM player. Uh, what we have to do is we have to click on create a new virtual machine. Create a new virtual machine. And the VM player has two basic ways of creating virtual machines. One is an accelerated way where it just says, OK, I already know everything about Fedora. I already have made all the selections that I think you would like. Just tell me where the ISO is, and we'll get started. That's a very accelerated way. I really don't want to do that because I want you to see what the installer looks like. Uh, but it basically says that uh, VM player is trying to help people install operating systems um, quickly. So what I will do is I'll select that third option that says I will install the operating system later. Okay? First we'll create the hardware and then just like a normal system we'll, re we'll, we'll, we'll uh, install Linux from scratch. So I will install the operating system later. Next. What type of operating system is it going to be? It's going to be Linux and uh, we'll select here, select here Fedora. Uh, if, if it's uh, one of the selections. Okay, right there. Let's select Fedora, not 64-bit. If I recall, you can see that our DVD, uh, i386, means it's a 32-bit uh, software on the ISO. If, uh, if it was 64-bit, uh, it would have a different label. Uh, it, it would tell us. So we are going to select 32-bit, so it's the first one. And it actually doesn't say anything. It, we just know that it's 32-bit. The other one is 64-bit, so select this one. We'll go ahead and say Next. And uh, let's go ahead and uh, say Fedora. After that, I'll put Monday. You can put your name on this folder. Okay, That way you'll know that it's, uh, that it's the one that you installed. It'll be easier for you to find. The other uh, thing we need to change is let's browse to a different location for where we're going to store the files. I would like us to go to computer, the C drive, and go ahead and select VM images as the folder. Okay, VM images. And we're doing that because if you put this uh, VM system inside of your documents, it might be wiped clean when you log off. You might not have the, the right uh, disk uh, quota. So the best thing is to put it inside of this VM images folder. Yes. So we go to browse. 
and then we go under computer and then we select VM images and you might have to you might actually have to type in here uh, Fedora Monday so you may have to type in the final directory name okay all right all right let me uh, pause right here and we'll great so let's continue I'll go ahead and press next now we are going to make a couple of important decisions first of all uh, when you make this decision inside of a real physical box you sort of commit yourself to something important. In virtualization, you can actually trick the system and resize physical hard drives, um, do things that you can't do in the physical world. But right here, it's important that you choose uh, more than 20 gig. In the classroom, we likely are not going to use it all up. But at home, when you're running this, you might be installing additional software, and you will see that 20 gig is not actually that much. Okay? So usually, I will put here 80 gig. Now, 80 gig doesn't mean that suddenly we're going to lose 80 gigabytes from my, our C drive. It just says, what is the total capacity that, that we will allow this virtual drive to grow? And virtual drive is going to be a file on the file system. So it'll start from zero. After the installation is completed, it'll go to two gig or so. And then as you continue to use the system and install more software, it'll grow beyond that. Okay? But I'll go ahead and put 80 gigabytes here. Uh, we're saying, um, once we start downloading all these MP3s, we want to have, you know, the 80 gig to store them. Now, this is an important decision right here. Store virtual disk as a single file or multiple files. Because Linux uses a file system called ext3 or ext4, which are great file system types, which support large files. So you can have a 20 gig single file. But sometimes the host operating system, in this instance, it's uh, Windows 7, okay, and it is probably using NTFS, also not a problem for large files, but if you're using at home Windows XP and you happen to have, have FAT32, you'll notice that that file system only supports up to two gigabytes uh, of, of file size. Okay, many reasons for it, but basically that's the restriction. So uh, even though I said I would like to have 80 gigabytes, your virtual machine will start breaking down when it reaches two gigabytes. So to resolve it, uh, we will say split the virtual disk into multiple files. This is also a good decision even, even if you're using NTFS because if at some point you choose to move your, your virtual machine to another disk, you will find that uh, you might be using, maybe you're using a flash drive, flash disk. And look, my, my virtual machine is three gigabytes in size. I have an eight gig flash disk. Why isn't it working? Well, it isn't working because your flash disk is FAT32, right? Uh, also, you might choose to, hey, I'm just going to FTP these files to my some other location. It's easier to do that with two gig files than to do it in one huge file, okay? So multiple reasons why we want to make sure that we split the virtual disk into multiple files. And we'll say go next. All right. At this point, we've created hardware, which is virtualized, which happens to have a hard drive of 80 gigabyte maximum size, one gig of memory. It has a network adapter, and it has a number of other devices. Let's click customize hard hardware. And this is a great GUI to a single text file. All these. Uh, controls and all these questions that we are asked are actually part of a single text file that you can just go with notepad and edit. We have one gigabyte of memory. That's plenty. Okay. Let's look at processors. You see on systems with multiple cores, you can actually give your virtual machine one, two, or three CPUs. Okay. You sometimes want to do that um, when you are using the virtual machine as your as your primary tool, because otherwise your host operating system is holding three CPUs away uh, from, from your virtual machine. Okay, so those are processors. Then we have, uh, uh, then we have the actual uh, CD-ROM. All right, right now our CD-ROM 
virtual IC ROM is pointing to the D drive. The D drive is automatically linked to the optical drive that you have in your PC. But I happen not to have the CD-ROM itself. If you want to uh, um, take the CD-ROM from the book, put it in the drive, that would work perfectly. What I would like to do is I would like to use this virtualized CD, uh, CD-ROM, the ISO file. So at this time, I'll select use the ISO image, then I'll say browse, and I am going to go under computer, C drive, ISO, and Fedora. So now, what we just did, which is really neat, what we did is we took an ISO file that in any other system, I would have to first burn on a CD-ROM, then put it into the CD drive, and then boot up the computer. We just downloaded an ISO file, and we told virtualization, look at this ISO file, and let's pretend that this is an actual optical drive. Okay? And, and that's going to work just like that. Great. With all that in place, I'll say close, and we'll say finish. And at this point, we have an empty virtual hardware. Let me show you what this empty virtual hardware looks like. Under VM images, I now have a folder. You see, my entire operating system is inside of this folder. If I back up this folder on Monday, I can get a virus on Tuesday, I can ruin my machine on Wednesday, and then I can still restore from this folder and have my entire hardware as it was on Monday. So we're not just saying uh, we're backing up the operating system. That all is, you know, your bookmarks, your software, all that is, is backed up. Also, your entire hardware is backed up. So if you went and changed some BIOS settings, all of that would be back the, the way it was originally. Inside of this folder, we have uh, key files. All these files down here, these are parts of our disk. And you can see that all of them are, are empty. 320K, they just have a header inside of them, and, and, and they're empty. This file right here, and uh, unfortunately my extensions are hidden. Let's see. Uh, folder options view, show, there we go. Well, that didn't work. Okay, view, don't show, show hidden files, hikes, oh, there it is, I thought I clicked on it, okay. Okay, so now I have extensions. The key file that contains the hardware configuration is inside of fedoramonday.vmx. So that VMX is the config file. If I was to open this file with Notepad, uh, okay, open with Notepad, you can see that this is a text file, and this text file says here, for memory, just go ahead and, and give one gigabyte, okay? Um, for the CD drive, this is the image location. Okay, so that's how we can reconfigure it later if, if we want to. And it's only in the text file. Okay, so at this point, what we are ready to do is we're ready to boot the system. This is no different than putting the CD-ROM in the, in the, hard drive, in the um, optical drive of your computer and then pressing the button to start. The button to start is at, uh, towards the bottom of the screen, Play Virtual Machine. Okay, we play the virtual machine, and it says software resolution is incompatible with long mode on this one. Okay, um, that's fine. I didn't expect really this message, but, but that's fine. We'll just say don't show this again. Okay. Sometimes when you boot the virtual machine, you'll get uh, information like uh, you're going to need some virtual tools, or maybe there are updates available. We'll just skip all those. The keyboard hook timeout value is not set. That's fine. Do not show this message. OK. And uh, it's trying to get a hold of my uh, microphone. And we'll say OK to that. And now software updates. Make sure to say remind me later. We, again, we don't have the rights to install those. OK. So now we have certain options. We can install a system. 
we can um, uh, try to uh, install a system with just the command line. We can rescue a system. We can boot from local drive, which would boot the Windows system. We can run memory test. And we have about a minute to make that uh, decision. If you just let it uh, go, it'll go ahead and start the installation. Notice that in the virtual uh, machine, I can't take my cursor out of virtual machine. If I click inside of the virtual machine, my cursor disappears. Okay? To get my cursor back, I have to press Control Alt. That's how your cursor comes out of your virtual machine. It's a little bit of a trick, okay? But uh, but uh, that's that, that's how that works. It's Control Alt. It'll it'll release your cursor. Okay, so at this point we are installing the system, and right now, oh, let me just do this. Right now, I have uh, two options. I can either test my ISO file, which is going to take a long time, okay, or I can say skip. Right now, the risk that we are running is fairly low. In other words, if our installation fails because the ISO file is somehow broken, it, it got corrupted during download, uh, then we're stuck anyway, and we have to re-download the ISO file. It's going to take us a while. So we'll just be optimists, and we'll say skip. Okay? It makes sense to test your disk before installation so that you don't spend an hour waiting for this operating system to install, uh, and then you find out that some file there is, is corrupted. Even worse, you started the installation, you overrode a working system, and now your system is not working until you come up with a different media. But we'll say skip, we'll skip for this test. If you said OK, and you see that it's going to take five hours to test the ISO, um, go ahead and just restart for four to five minutes. OK. <laughs> I might be exaggerating at times. OK, with this in place, OK, we now have a Fedora uh, 14 uh, welcome screen. We'll say next. That's the only option to select, so we'll just go ahead and do that. English is a fine language for this installation. We'll continue with that. The keyboard selection is fine, too, in English. OK, <laughs> that's fine. OK, now we have a couple of options. Basic storage devices okay, would include our local disks, like IDE drives, um, um, SATA drives, anything that's local, USB drives. Specialized storage, you can see it, it says fiber channel, iSCSI. So, in, in many uh, situations today, uh, servers don't come with local disks. Okay? Maybe like in a, um, uh, often in blade systems, you have uh, five or six servers in a, in a, in a single uh, chassis. And then you're using disk that's a remote. Right? So now that's what it says. OK, if you have the specialized storage device, tell me more about it. And it'll actually be able to install through a network uh, remotely. I What's that? Well, it's not really cloud uh, from the perspective like Amazon services or iCloud or, or Google, but it is cloud in the way that it's a network uh, connection, but it's a very expensive server that someone pur purchased in your office, like maybe it's a NetApp or EMC uh, storage. I should say, though, here that it is possible to do Linux installation remotely. So let's say that you have a, a, a hard, um, you have a physical drive and you don't have a monitor on it, okay? You can put a CD drive, CD-ROM drive in, and you would have to customize it in, uh, ahead of time to say that uh, my workstation in the office has this specific IP address. And then the entire installation would be running on the physical uh, uh, system, but all the graphical interfaces are displayed in your office on your workstation, so that's how you make the choices. Uh, the other way to install uh, Linux, uh, especially Fedora or Red Hat or CentOS, um, without your intervention is through something called Kickstart. And Kickstart is simply software that allows you to first make all the choices for installation, record them in a small file, record all of that onto a CD-ROM that, that contains the installation media, and then you can just plug it in and the operating system basically starts installing itself. 
that is, uh, you know, fairly useful maybe in a, in a computer lab when you're installing 20 systems or maybe you have a specific type of a server that you always install, you can then automate it that way. Yes? Uh, you could, although it's risky. Here's why. Uh, if you lose connectivity, right, then your installation might fail. So a, a better way to do that would be this. You can use VNC or you can use um, export of the X server protocol. You, you do that to a workstation in your office. Let's say it's a Windows workstation. You do it there. And on Windows, you can run something called SIGWIN they'll give you X window uh, server. So you do all of that to the workstation in the office, then you can use your mobile phone with maybe remote desktop. There are apps out there, inexpensive, where you do remote desktop to your window system, or you do VNC session from your phone to your workstation in the office. That way, if you lose the connection to your office, it's not a problem, you just reconnect and everything else is still running fine. But if you do that, the direct connection between your phone and the installation machine, then you open yourself up for network issues and basically have to restart from scratch, which remotely, it's not that easy to push that power button you know, in, in, in there. So having that intermediate workstation that keeps you grounded and keeps uh, the services running it makes good sense. Basic storage devices and then next. Okay, if you see any errors here, don't worry about it. Uh, basically. Uh, the uh, disk is going to be initialized. We'll just say reinitialize all. Now we get to choose the host name. Most of the time for development systems, it'll say local host, that local domain. Go ahead and put your name here. I'll put my login ID here. That's basically the name of your server. But this is the name of your server as your server knows it. Unless this is in the DNS server itself, you will not be able to use that name to, to remotely access the system. So a lot of times the administrator will go to the DNS server ahead of time, pick a static IP for that server, give it a name, and then that's the name that you would use here. Next. All right. There is actually a Detroit selection here. So we'll go back to the Ds and we'll grab Detroit. This choice right here is important because it's going to set this choice is important because it's going to set the time zone. Time zones are very tricky things which are going to manage uh, time synchronization and, and when to forward you an hour, when to back you down an hour. So you don't want to ma make uh, a mistake here. You want to you keep it uh, the correct time zone. Uh, you want to uncheck the system clock. Okay. Uncheck the system clock because we are in a virtualized world. If this was a physical system, there will be a physical clock that runs on the motherboard, okay? And that is a very reliable system. Once your motherboard is virtualized and now it's all software, that clock okay, is not going to be as reliable. So, so we uncheck that. We're going to say next. Uh, by the way, there are other services that will help us to keep the time correct. Uh, there's something called NTP um, network time protocol, and it's going to maybe every hour, every five minutes, however we set it, it can resynchronize re our time. Now we get to choose the administrator password. Uh, the administrator is actually an account on Unix systems called root. Okay, uh, so you don't get to choose the user ID, but you do get to choose the password. Please choose the password that you can remember. Okay. It's easier when this password is simple. Uh, we are not uh, creating right now a system that we're in fear of someone hacking into. Uh, the true risk is that you set a password here that's very secure and then you forget what it is. Not the end of the world. Uh, I'll show you how to reset passwords like that so that you can uh, reset a, a forgotten administrator password. Uh, but right now, just go ahead and, and try to keep it simple. We'll go ahead and choose a password for the root account. Say, say it again. Uh, 
Uh, not necessarily. The, the actual, on, on Unix systems, it works like this. The root administrator is always right. Okay? So while every other user on the system has to use a complex password, the administrator <laughs> can do whatever they want. Okay? It may sound a little bit counterintuitive, uh, but there is, um, there is a certain model of, of thinking behind it. So yes, you get this message when the password is weak, but you can say use anyway. When you're a regular user, you, you don't have the choice. You actually have to set a, a good password. On the other hand, when you are the administrator, you can set for that user an easy password, and then it'll still work. <laughs> All right. <laughs> we'll say use anyway. OK, now we have choices here uh, for installation. We can go ahead and use the entire uh, space. Let's, let's select Create Custom Layout. OK, I want to say Create Custom Layout just to show you how this might work. Next. OK, so right now I have 80 gigabytes of free space. This free space might or might not actually exist in real world because I can have a 10 gigabyte hard drive in Windows and I can tell my virtual player uh, create a disk that's 100 gig in size and it'll do it because you see initially you're not using any disk space at all. It's only when you grow beyond that initial 10 gig that you actually have that the virtual machine is going to complain can't continue and it'll just freeze. Okay. So right now this 80 gig is all you know funny business because it doesn't actually exist. Yes. There is. I'm not aware of a, of a limit, although nothing is unlimited, right? So there are always um, certain uh, physical limitations. Having said that, let's say that you have uh, a uh, let's say that you have one terabyte SATA drive. You can put second 100 gigabyte SATA drive in Windows, and then you can put half of your um, virtual files on one disk and half of them on the other. Therefore, the virtual machine will see two terabyte single disk, right? Um, so there's all kinds of tricks that, uh, that you can uh, do to make the virtual system really, really large. Um, yeah, but there's no limitation as far as, as far as I'm aware. Let's go to, say, create. Now we are creating the operating system. If you ever installed Windows, how many partitions do you have to have on Windows to actually run it? One, yeah. So usually it will be called C, right? It's not like you get to choose other letters. I mean, you might love other letters. You might think letter A is the first letter in the alphabet. Why can't it be the A disk? And historically, there are issues with that. It's called a floppy disk. <laughs> OK, so in our system, we have a couple of choices right away. We can right away say, I need to work with RAID. And RAID basically allows us to spread our partitions across multiple drives. Uh, we do that sometimes for speed, or we do it for reliability, so that we might put half of the file on one disk, half of the file on the other disk. It's going to be much faster. Or we can say, let's put this file on this disk and the second disk, so when, I, when one disk fails, the other one is available. Okay? We'll talk about RAID later on more, but that's when, when we can start working with it. Or we can start working with an LVM, or Logical Value Manager, which basically is another trick. Logical Value Manager allows you to create some physical disk elements, like let's say this is one terabyte disk and another one terabyte disk and I can put a single file system across both of those drives. That's Logical Vo uh, Volume Manager. Or with Logical Volume Ma Manager, today I can decide that my Linux will have one gigabyte. Tomorrow I can resize it virtually and make it larger. Okay? So uh, if you look at maybe your C partition in Windows, once you start running out of disk space on C drive, but you do have more disk on your logical drive, you, you really have few choices. You might grab partition magic or QPart and try to resize it. With Logical Volume Manager, you can just say, make it bigger, and it'll resize it on the fly. Okay? Yes? So would that be like a good option if you don't make workstation for people working on it? Just so they don't go over like download things, whatever? No. Um, 
uh, I'll show you another way to deal with that problem. But logical uh, volume manager is is it's it's a great approach. And some of those uh, previous choices, when it said, "Would you like me to make the decisions for you?" They would have uh, used logical volume manager. Okay. The problem with logical volume manager is that uh, it it brings new complexity to the server which means that once you go and try to use your backups or try to do certain uh, commands, uh, you have to remember that that's a virtual uh, stuff. We already are virtualizing one layer of our system. Okay? It, it's best to, to keep it um, virtualized only at one level, okay? to start with at least. Um, okay, but that's, I want to show you the standard partitions first so that later on lo logical volume manager will actually make sense. So we'll go ahead and say create a standard partition. We are going to create today three partitions. Okay? These three partitions, in my mind, are, are the minimum. Technically, the only partition that you really are required to make on, on Linux uh, to, to run it is this one right here, and that's called root. That's the only partition that you're required. I am actually going to start with a partition that's not required but makes really really good sense and that is swap okay a swap partition is basically area of disk space that's going to to uh, receive copies of what's in memory while uh, your system is running and you run out of memory it'll the system will start copying data on that partition it's not impossible to do what windows does and that is to create a page file inside of your linux system so that when you run out of memory, the page file get, starts to be filled up. Linux is going to a really ask at the beginning for a swap partition because in the past, it made better sense to have your ID drive and have your swap partition to be placed as the very first partition from the center of the cylinder. That way, as uh, this was a very heavily used partition, uh, the arm didn't have to make very long moves, therefore it was faster. Okay, uh, or maybe you have a separate disk, and that was your swap. All of those things were tricks that Unix administrators used to use to make the systems faster. For us, we're going to create swap partition on our virtual system, and uh, I'm just going to use 500 megabytes for this partition. The rule of thumb is to have your memory duplicated. So we have one gigabyte of memory. We should be using two gigabytes of swap. That makes sense on production systems, on systems that are supposed to run for years without a reboot. And that's very common with Unix systems, to run without a reboot for years. Uh, on our system, this two gigabyte would be really a wasted space because by the time our system is swapping two gigabytes okay, of, of swap, you're not get, getting uh, much work done uh, at all. So. 500 uh, meg is going to be plenty for our development system here. It's fixed in size. We're not going to encrypt this, and this is not going to be forced to be the pri primary partition. We'll say OK to that. Next partition to create, standard partition. This one is going to be called boot. The boot partition is technically not required but a really good idea because at some point you might uh, run into boot issues and you might, uh, uh, you might want to be able to uh, work with a boot partition uh, separate. Also, as the kernel uh, boots initially, it's going to mount the boot partition. So a small size here makes good sense. We will leave it at 500 megabytes. Uh, in the past, 100 megabytes was enough, but as you add new kernels or as you basically upgrade your system, more and more disk space is required on the boot partition. Because unlike other operating systems, Linux allows you to go back and forth between previous versions of the system. So I can say, hey, I'd like to run Windows XP today, or I want to run Windows 7 tomorrow. All right? On Linux, you can say, I want to run a previous version of the kernel. And at the boot time, you just select the previous version of the kernel. So uh, 500 megabytes is fine, OK to that. All right, the next partition that we will create is going to be the root partition. And the root partition, most of the time in this situation, I would have said, fill to the maximum allowable size. The reason why I'll typically do that is because 
Servers today, as we create them, are going to be uh, back-end services. Maybe it's a database server. Okay? So my database is going to need as much space uh, as, as, as I can provide. If this was an interactive system, maybe something like our Raider system, where there are many, many users and everybody wants to create some files and then I have to manage the disk space well, I would possibly create, in addition, uh, a different uh, partition called home and then give a specific uh, number of megabytes for this partition. What it means is that when, when people start downloading files, MP3s and such, they will not fill up my root partition, which would cause my operating system to stop, but they are going to fill up and, and basically uh, use all the disk space inside of the home partition. So that provides uh, protection for the operating system itself. But if you're building a database server, if you're bu building a DNS server or a web server, uh, you really uh, are able to control uh, these sizes uh, in a different way. So normally that's what I would select. I will not do that today because later on in our course we will be using FDisk and we will be looking at uh, creating additional partitions uh, by hand. So I will say fill all space up to and uh, I will leave uh, maybe two gigabytes free. So out of the 80 gigabytes we already took 500 meg for swap 500 meg for boot, and now we're taking two uh, for uh, this empty space. So that's three gigabytes. So I should end up with about 77 gigabytes on my root partition. So that's how it is. You've noticed me uh, use swap uh, previously. ext4 is a great file system type. The newest one, the fastest. Uh, fewer limitations. EXT3 is also fine. EXT2 does not have journaling, so it has certain, uh, um, there are reasons why, why, why we don't use that anymore. So EXT4 is going to be fine. We'll say OK. And now I have, uh, well that didn't work, what did I do wrong? Fill all space up to 2 gigabytes. Okay, I guess it works, let's see, opposite here. Let's see, 78, 1, 2, 3. There we go. Well, that's leaving 3. I'm not sure that that works uh, as, as I expected. Fill all space. Fill all space up to, see, I think it works actually opposite than it, than it should. Yes, question? Okay. Go ahead and just recreate the, the virtual machine. Delete the folder in, under VM images and just recreate it. You'll still have uh, uh, time to do that today. We'll make sure that you're successful with it. Okay, well. Uh, we would do, mm -hmm. we already used one gigabyte in the first two, so I would say it fell off to 77 and that should be the amount because well, yeah, so it really doesn't make that much difference. But basically, if I set 79 here, it would probably leave me with two gigabytes free. Um, but this is this is this is fine. Basically, we have a very large root partition, 500 megabyte for boot, and then we have uh, some free space. There are other partitions that we could have separated. Um, all these other partitions here are. Uh, typical partitions, although I can type in, if I want to have user local oracle as a separate partition, I could do that, okay? So the mount points, you can, you can go ahead and type in um, uh, as, as you will. These are the most commonly separated partitions, okay? Most commonly separated. Cancel that, say next, and it says, okay, we're going to change certain things, that's fine, format it, write changes to disk, the software is called Druid, what you see right here uh, for creating these partitions. Uh, once, so, well, once partitions are created, we will use FDisk to actually modify them. But Druid is really nice and you can use it during installation time. All right, so what we'll do is we'll, I'll, I'll run through this installation. It takes about 20 minutes to actually install, so I'll be able to go back and help you guys to, uh, 
to resolve uh, some of the installation issues. Do we click the right yes. Disk? Yep. Right change to disk. Okay. So in this uh, screen, I can I can uh, give a, a new label to my system. Question. Okay, did you check, check the checkbox next to it? Yeah, so you have to select the checkbox right here. Yeah, I get that. Okay. Okay, don't now use it. Yep. Okay, so so now we'll go ahead and, and say next. This label is just fine. Uh, by the way, if you, if you did dual boot, uh, this screen will detect that Windows is installed on the same drive, and it will allow you to have two labels so that you choose back and forth between Windows and Linux. If you are doing dual boot, make sure to install Windows first and Linux second. If you install Linux first and then Windows, Windows uh, does not allow you to create this custom bootloader. You would have to do it afterwards, and it, it, it's more difficult. So make sure to install Linux as the second operating system. OK, now what, what, what is happening is, we get to choose the type of a server, which basically gives us a pre-selected uh, list of software that is going to be installed on our system. Also, we get to select what's called a repository. The repository that's already in, uh, selected is our DVD drive, our ISO uh, file. So this is not a networked uh, repository. But we can create additional repositories, which then go over the network and maybe uh, connect to Google, Adobe, and other repositories that are, that are out there. I'll say customize now. So that way, even though I have the graphical desktop selected, I want to make uh, more selections. OK, and so now, this is how you add and remove software from your initial installation. Can you say next yes. Yep, just hit next. So some of the things that I would typically select, uh, under development, I say development tools, which basically will give me the C++ compiler. Um, I will, so I'll select development tools. Under servers, I'll say uh, FTP server, mail server, and maybe the web server. And then I want to make sure that under base system, I'll select system tools. And, and that's fine. So notice that I'm, I'm making these selections, but all of this can be changed later by adding software once everything is installed. The issue here is, and that's really the only issue, if you are going to upgrade your system, then you will have to use the uh, upgraded uh, media or use the networked repositories to install additional software, which, which is not a problem uh, usually. Yes? OK, on the left, select base system. That's what I have selected. Yep, there you go. So now I'll go ahead and, oh, uh, by the way, you can also go to optional packages. So for every one of these elements on the right, there are some uh, optional packages that you can, uh, you can add in addition. So these are the actual names of uh, packages of software that, that you are installing. Here is a, an R desktop package, which is very commonly used. You say R desktop, then the IP address of your Windows host, and you actually get a remote desktop connection on your Linux system. We'll say next. And from now on, until the system is running, the installation process is actually taking over. Okay? So, so this is how the installation uh, of, of Linux is taking place. Uh, what I will do next is um, I'll go ahead and uh, allow this to install.
Okay, so, so question was, uh, if you change control to the desktop, will it work? Yes, it will. If I was to stop the installation right here, uh, I, I, when I pr press this button, it'll suspend the virtual machine, which means that the uh, installation just pauses, like the world stops, but then when you resume, it'll start installing right after that. So it's a really beautiful way, you know, to to be very flexible. So if you're working on the laptop on something, you can just say pause the world and then resume when you have uh, the battery comes back, you know. Uh, what I wanted to show you, and I'm going to minimize this machine for, for this period of time, I'm going to create a new virtual machine while this one is working. I want to show you how to access the BIOS in the virtual OS system because there's actually a separate BIOS for it. So I will quickly create a a simple virtual machine. Um, skip this version. No, no, no. Just, just uh, uh, in, in this uh, system, I'll go with maybe something like Red Hat Six. I'll say next. This doesn't matter. Next. Uh, this doesn't matter. Finish. Okay. So I don't have the installation media for Red Hat Six, but what I'm trying to sh to show is I'm going to run this virtual machine. And there is a key I need to press just at the right time to get into the BIOS. I think I might be already past that screen. Yeah, so let's try that really quickly. So power reset. And I think it's a, the, yes, please. Ah, uh, so many messages. So uh, two things I have to do, I have to click on the black screen to have the focus inside of the virtual, virtual machine, and then I have to press the, the key to, to call up the BIOS. So we'll try to make that happen. I think the hamster in the computer is running really slow right now. Virtual machine, power, power off. Virtual machine is busy, thank you. Probably because you're trying to do it while you're running your installation on another one. Technically, they should be independent, but, but you know what I didn't do is I didn't check how much memory this assigned. If, if the memory is overcommitted, then you know it makes the page file go really crazy for that time. Oh, two gig of mem memory. Yeah, that's pretty. That's high. Yeah, that's okay. A little paging will be okay. Uh, let's see. <laughs> yeah. All right, so my end price is, what if I said stop? Can you do that? <laughs> Say it again? Change your memory size. For no, you can only do that when the machine is shut down. Yeah, it'll page itself silly in a minute, and it'll come back. Since I was not... Um, booting the operating system, but yeah, the memory was, was already being dedicated. That's okay. All right, so I really would like to stop this instead of, yeah, stop that. I think it very quickly just went and restarted. That's okay, this entertainment is brought to you while we're waiting for, for Fedora to install anyway. Oh, uh, the great thing about virtualization, though, is that you can go to VMware.com and you can download pre-made directories vir with virtual machines that someone else installed. So if you uh, think about maybe trying some virtual appliance or some um, you know, other type of Linux, uh, people build virtual machines and then they upload them because there's no licensing involved. You can just download it and, and run. Okay, so yeah, that, that, was, that was a mistake on my part. Let's edit this here. And let's make this really small. OK. 
Okay, that's fine. Okay, so with this in place, let's try my reflexes here. Play virtual machine. Uh, the limit is going to be memory most of the time. So when you run out of memory, then you'll run into this type of a situation where... Right. Mm -hmm. Okay, hopefully this one... Yeah, this one's still running fine. Question. Because that might, if the other one's installing with one gig, it might just be slowing everything down so much because maybe it's only two gigs a whole, and then you got Windows running two on it, using up a certain amount of it. Yeah, I, the, the virtual machine made some recommendations to us initially, so it would not allow us to actually subscribe to more memory than it had. But, but then when you made a second virtual machine. Yeah, that, that definitely was not the, the best. Um, so we have here four gig of two. <laughs> so this is not even okay. Yeah. Yeah. So so two point eight. Yeah, I probably I forget how much memory I get. Yeah. That's all right. So now I should be able to say power and then and then reset and that should be working much better because now it's not going back and forth. Say what? Yeah, yeah. Never mind here. Okay, let's do that again. Power and then reset. Are you sure you want to? Yes. Okay, see quickly, it said VMware. That's the one that I need to be attentive to. So reset one more time. Yes. And I uh, already went. Okay. <laughs> what key is it that you have to press? That, I am not sure. I think it's delete, but I'm not positive. Maybe I should take just a screenshot of it first. <laughs> I think I would. <laughs> you think it's in the hardware somewhere? Yeah. But this is so much fun. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. So let's uh, let's figure out. First, I don't remember where where it put. There it is. Virtual machines. I think it put right here. Okay. So it's in the VMX file. And if I edit this file, uh, share. Open with Notepad. And I look for BIOS. Oops. No, just boot delay. I look for boot. Okay, I have to add that. BIOS. In milliseconds. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, milliseconds. Um, five thousand. Five seconds. All right. 
Okay, so at this point, I just, I'm going to do this. Power, power off, yes. And now I'll save this because it let me do it. Now I close this. Now I play the virtual machine. And hopefully now I don't have to actually do anything, right? I just say, okay, oh, there it is. Thank you. And now uh, what do I press? F2. <laughs> so my, I might have been quick enough with the delete button. Who knows? All right, but this is, this is what we're talking about when it, comes to virtualization, right? This is an actual hardware piece that has its own BIOS. And now in the BIOS, sometimes you have to go to the boot screen and you have to say, okay, go ahead and select the CD-ROM before you select the hard drive. Uh, some of you, for whatever reason, uh, your screen froze or you failed on the first initial install and the ISO gets only um, connected when the CD-ROM drive is first. Right? So if the CD-ROM, which for some reason the VM player is trying to be smarter than the administrator, basically the moment you engage the installation, they're already resetting the BIOS for you automatically for the hard drive to be ahead of the CD-ROM drive. See the problem? So you can either recreate the virtual machine and then rerun the installation, or you have to go back to the BIOS, be quick enough, and then reset that back so that CD-ROM, CD-ROM would be first. Um, but that is, that's the beauty of virtualization. You, you can play with the BIOS, you can do all the things that, uh, that I need to, to be done. So I'll go ahead and, and close that. And uh, I'll go back to my, well, my, my installation is not breaking any records uh, in terms of um, how quickly it's going. Uh, let me see, what did I do here? I have one, yeah. So. Here's another rule of thumb when it, when, it comes to, uh, when it comes to memory and virtualization. Different operating systems are dealing with memory differently. Okay. Uh, for example, Windows is going to use memory uh, more than Linux. So a lot of times what you see in enterprise is the host operating system is Linux, and then Windows is the uh, client machine, the guest operating system. When you try to, like I did, try to allocate uh, one gigabyte to the virtual machine, leaving one gigabyte to the operating system, uh, oftentimes Windows is going to ask for more. And one thing that's going to always fail in virtualization, that's if your host operating system is having problems, okay, that's going to affect everything else. So you want to make sure that uh, you uh, you leave enough uh, memory for the host operating system. So really, see, they recommend one gigabyte. We really probably should have stayed below that, maybe uh, between 512 and 700 uh, meg. Um, we're not going to worry about it at, at this point. We'll, we'll say okay, but uh, that that was probably would have been uh, more more efficient. Also, now that I already made the mistake of trying to run another virtual machine with two gigabytes of memory. <coughs> which basically caused Windows to start uh, swapping its own programs. Now that Windows started already swapping, I may not recover from some of those slowdowns until I reboot Windows. So that, you know, that, that's just how, how, how that works. Okay, so now that this is installing, uh, uh, I, I think we're doing okay. Oh, uh, let me discuss for a moment what these tools are. VMware provides software that will optimize the guest operating system. Uh, so let's say that uh, you are uh, running, um, you're running a system and then, or you're trying to install some Linux operating system and your display isn't running correctly. Your, your, your video card isn't running correctly. Once you actually installed the operating system, you can add these VM tools and they will optimize your display adapter, okay? They'll provide the operating system certain drivers that VMware knows about, those are some known bugs, and they'll, they'll make the virtual uh, guest operating system work better. But this is a great way of running Linux at home, being flexible with it, trying Fedora today, maybe trying Debian tomorrow, okay? And, uh, and you can make mistakes and very quickly uh, go back uh, without without being stuck, because right now I could do homework for another class, I could check email, right? I can do other things on a working operating system while the installation is taking place. 
All right. Um, Okay, so at this point, uh, a, lot of, a lot of you already have yours uh, completed. So go ahead and create a, a user account. Go ahead and create a user account for your system. Uh, someone asked, and uh, this may or may not appear on the test, how many user accounts do you have to create while installing Linux? Okay, what do you think is the answer? Yeah, well, so there is a technical answer, okay, and there is the answer that on Linux Plus exam is the right choice. The technical answer is, if you have the root account, that's all you really need. On the next screen, you could say cancel or don't create another account. But really, the GNOME, which is the, the, the desktop uh, program, uh, in the new versions of it, it will not allow you to log in as root. See, the, the, the main reason why Windows XP and Windows 95 and 98 uh, created such a bad security situation and made so much money for the virus protection you know, industry is because people were running the desktop as administrators. And then you go to, through Inner Explorer to some website that you mistyped and you got a virus, right? If you were to operate your desktop as a uh, underprivileged account, you go to the same website and you don't have the rights to install that virus. So that's where GNOME is going. So, so, the, so the, the answer that, that the exam will, will uh, ask for are two accounts, administrator account and a, and a user account. Um, but just like uh, when talking about partitions, you know, how many partitions are required to, to install Linux? I could say one because technically only root is required. But the correct answer is going to be, most likely, is going to be swap and root. Okay, uh, I like to have at least three where there's swap, root, and boot. Now all the other ones, they just will depend on the type of system that you're preparing. Okay, so that's where I'm at right now. I'll go ahead and say reboot. And uh, we can go ahead and do that. I'm always scared when I press this button because <laughs> it feels like the whole thing is going to uh, reboot and I'm doing uh, the recording and other things on the other system. But I can say safely reboot, and it basically is just rebooting the, um, the virtual machine. And, and there is again where um, it's a nice feature on these virtual machines. Uh, I, for example, run a Windows virtualized. My uh, main system is usually uh, Linux or, or Macintosh, and I will use Windows virtualized for my uh, Java development and for, for other systems. So that way I can duplicate that virtual machine, which becomes really a program, a utility, and I duplicate it across the other environments. Um, okay, if you press escape, it a a actually shows you a lot of detail of how the system is booting. And one of our future classes is going to be about the entire process of booting. So uh, if you don't want to see that uh, progress bar, you just press escape. Okay, a nice welcome screen, forward, understood, please proceed, forward, I'll create an account, I'll create a password, and of course I'm going to have to come up with a good password. Uh, uh, what's that? Really? There it is. And I think this check mark just checks whether the first one matches the second one. Uh, and, and this looks fine. Forward the date. Uh, by the way, the dates here from now on will always be wrong for me because I will not shut down my system. I'll put it in that suspension. And uh, hi, it's sort of, it's not real hibernation, it's just suspended. Uh, so it'll think next Monday <laughs> that it's five minutes from now. So, so that's not going to be uh, so bad. Uh, we'll just say forward. And uh, don't send the profile, is fine. Okay, and that's how we install uh, Fedora Linux. And this installation was not that much different than what you would have done on a physical piece of hardware, right? So we'll go ahead and uh,
select our account, uh, type in the password. Ah. And, and this is our desktop. The textbook is based on Fedora 13. Fedora 13 and 14, they were not that, uh, that big of a, of a difference. Fedora, uh, the newer ones, I think 16 and up, go to a different GNOME, different desktop, a newer version uh, 3, I believe it is. So what you'll find is that in the new versions of Linux, you don't have the upper um, drop-down with, um, with programs and you don't have the taskbar at the bottom, uh, but basically the interface changes. It's more like a mobile application, I think. Uh, you know, the, the sort of uh, uh, changing the way, the way users deal with the desktop. Uh, I'm, I'm used to this environment, so I'm fine with it, but I am not afraid to learn something new. I'm sure that important people thought it was uh, useful to change, and so I'm happy to do that. Okay, uh, any questions about the installation? Okay, what I'll do is I'll, um, I'll stop the recording at this point.